Thank you very much. I, all, I hope all of you have the handouts. What I would like to do with you, and uh, since uh, David said what he said, I think the most important thing for me is to say that I, uh, I was a student of Professor Flusser, and I liked him, and I dedicated uh, my book on the Hashmonian states in light of the scrolls to uh, Professor Flusser. The Dead Sea Scrolls is, is this amazing story. It's an amazing story not only because of uh, the way that it was found, but all, also because uh, the influence that it had about uh, Jewish and Christian relations, about the study of the New Testament and so on. And I find myself here as, as a student of Flusser, and I find myself uh, when I was teaching at the Harvard Divinity School, I find myself in a very awkward situation that as an orthodox scholar teaching at Baghdad University, every once in a while I have to teach Christian students that they have to take serious uh, the details that occurred in uh, the, the New Testament. What, in the handouts, I did two things. First of all, I chosen the most important text that I believe, uh, the most important text that were found in Kuman that shed light on the New Testament, and we'll study them together. And the second thing that I did, I gave a short bibliography list. Uh, and in it, you can see first the th three best uh, uh, books that are collective essays, the, for, the one that was done by Christel Stendhal in 1957 about the scrolls in the New Testament, that was done even uh, before the fragments from cave 4 were out, so basically he was working only with the seven scrolls from cave 1, and uh, this was a wonderful uh, collection that was published in 1957. Then uh, Jerome Murphy O'Connor from the Colby Bleak made a very nice uh, collection of articles about Paul and Kumran that appeared 11 years later in London, 1968. And then uh, Jim Charlesworth wrote a book about the fourth gospel in Kumran that appeared in uh, London in 1972. And basically, those are, until now, the best sources for uh, what I would like to share with you. But as uh, I want to show you now, there are much more texts that just were published that shed light about the New Testament, and I would like to talk with you about them. Now, as you all know, uh, most people who speak about the contribution of the scrolls to understanding the New Testament and divide the lecture or their talk to four topics. That's what they usually do. First, they speak about Jesus and the scrolls. Then they will speak about Paul and the scrolls. Then they will speak about the early church and the institute of the early church. And they will show how, uh, when you read Acts, you can use the scrolls in order to understand uh, Acts better. And you can see, you know, uh, you can show similarities, uh, sharing property, having a community meal, having an episcope, an overseer, speaking about praying to the east. They will show all those interesting things that uh, we find in uh, the early Jerusalemite church, which is originating from Kuman. And then they will speak about uh, the fourth gospel in Kuman, and they will show how the theology that was found in the scroll shed lights about our understanding of John. That's what usually people will do. But uh, you know there is a Murphy law that is uh, applying to everything we do, but especially to people who deals with text and history, and that's saying that uh, difficult questions have wrong, simple answers. Meaning that when you have a complicated question and you give it, you know, uh, you'll see that it's always more complicated. And if you have a complicated question and you give a complicated answer, there is a chance that you'll be right. It's a chance, it's not 100%. But if you give a simple answer, it's always wrong. Basically, <laughs> what uh, I would like to show you today is that there are more and more details that shed light on different verses in the New Testament that we can understand them much better now than we could understand them before. Now, in a very influential uh, paper that Professor Flusser wrote, uh, really at the beginning in the 50s, it was Blessed Are the Poors of sp in Spirit, in which Professor Flusser pointed to the similarity between the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 with a uh, a fragment of the Thanksgiving scroll, one Kiho de Yot. The first seven scrolls that were found in 1947 were the first scroll that we had. They were in good condition, most of them. One of them was the Thanksgiving scroll. The Thanksgiving scroll is divided into two parts. They are what we call the hymns of the teacher and are the hymns of the community. The hymns of the teacher 
are humans that uh, an individual, one individual, is telling us about his spiritual experience. And he's willing to share with us his uh, difficulties, his struggle, and the way he overcome his struggle. And he always thanked God. And he's uh, really willing to show, to tell us about his weaknesses. He tells us about how his disciple left him because he was unhumble and how he uh, had uh, repented. And he tells us that his enemies were chasing him and he was paralyzed. And uh, it, those are very personal hymns, uh, the hymns of the teacher. And uh, in uh, column 23 of the new numbering, uh, just uh, for your uh, evidence, when uh, Professor Sukenik, the father of Egelia Dean, had uh, bought the Thanksgiving scroll, he saw immediately that there's two scribes, that at one point uh, the scroll was stopped being copied by the first scribe and the second scribe took over. And he was working on organizing the columns, but he died uh, before he was able to uh, find what was the right order of the columns. And therefore, when he, after he died, the Thanksgiving scroll was published, first all the complete columns that were written by the first scribe, then the columns that were written by the second scribe, then the fragments that were preserved from the first scribe, and then the fragments from the second scribe. So from the beginning, we knew that the order of the columns in uh, the Vitu Princess, in the place where uh, the Thanksgiving scroll was published in the book, that the Thanksgiving uh, scroll was published is not right. Therefore, uh, if you want, you can write that number one is column 23 of uh, the new column, and it was... Uh, Column 14, uh, I'm sorry, column 18 in the early column. When Flusser wrote, he called it column 18. Now we know it's column 23. And we have here a passage, and I will start reading in the middle of it, that he speaks that he will become a messenger in the cessation of the goodness, and uh, to the humble he might bring uh, glad things of great mercy, and he will proclaiming salvation from out of the fountain of holiness to the... What's important to us is the fear of the spirit, and then he will speak about everybody everlasting joy to those who mourn. Now, Professor Flusser had pointed out that when we look at the beginning of Matthew 5, it, we speaks about, as you all know, it speaks about first the people which are poor in the spirit, then to the people that are mourning, and then the people which are humble. And uh, this will be my... Uh, not very good translation of uh, the beginning of blessed are and so on. Now, Professor Flusser pointed out that uh, we have the same three groups here when he speaks about the people first that are uh, for the humbles, then he speaks about those people that are counter of the spirit. And this is Gezaver Mesh translation, and uh, all, the, all the translation I took is from Gezaver Mesh, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English. And, uh, Maybe I have, I, if I would have taken the American uh, book of a bag wise and uh, uh, who was the first? Uh, cook, yes. <laughs> if I would have taken a bag wise and cook, maybe it was more American and less English. But it's uh, not for our purposes. Professor Flusser showed it very nicely that the same groups that appears at the beginning of Matthew 5 appears here in this hymn uh, that the teacher have written. This is one of those very personal hymns. And uh, later on, uh, we had another text, which is different than Matthew 5, but is organized in the same way. If you look at uh, 4Q525 that was published by Emil Quesh, that will be to the right of the first handout. You'll see that it's the blessed is, and then it says, okay, blessed are those who hold, and so on, and then blessed are those who reject, and so on, and then blessed, and it's being based on this word, ashrei. And here, there's no question about this. Is we have the text in Kumani in Hebrew, and it's very easy for us to reconstruct uh, Matthew 5 uh, as uh, built on this formula, Ashrei, 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 blessed are, or blessed is. And uh, what's interesting here is that uh, we can debate, and you know people are debating about the question in what language Jesus was speaking with his disciples. I don't have... Uh, I don't have a doubt that Jesus spoke with his parents Aramaic. And I don't have doubts that uh, when he spoke with Peter by himself, he spoke Aramaic. But uh, it seems to me that when he was speaking, when he was giving lessons, when he was uh, giving a sermon, when he was uh, 
saying Matthew 5, for example, I don't have doubts that he was speaking Hebrew. Uh, as a student of Professor Flusser, Flusser and uh, Lindsay and other people had taught us that basically uh, at least some of the saying of Jesus should be translated into Hebrew and not Aramaic. I think this is a wonderful example. Nobody now, after finding 4Q525 and after comparing it to 1Q or the Yot, nobody uh, will have doubts that Matthew 5 was uh, said in Hebrew in this formula that we found in 4Q525. Uh, now, I'll, be ba I'll go back to uh, Flusser book later when I'll finish this lecture, but uh, this is uh, mostly known and the minute that 4Q525, there is, I mean, it's, everybody pointed out to this. I want to go to a more complicated example, but I find it more interesting, and this is the 4Q246. This is an Aramaic text, with number three in the handouts, again, in, in the right column in the middle. And uh, this is a text written in Aramaic in which uh, it says, speaking about the Son of God who will proclaim and uh, the Son of Most High they will call him and uh, like the Spirit. And uh, every one of you should remember that in the first, the first chapter of Luke when uh, Gabriel is talking to Mary is using exactly, exactly this language. And I mean, really this I think is the best example of the same verses that appears in Luke 1, appears now in one of the fragments in Qumran. Luke 1, 31 to 32, the angel is uh, talking with Mary and he tells her that she will have a son and uh, he shall be great and he shall be called son of the highest and the Lord God shall give him whatever. And so it's exactly a quotation. If you look at the bibliography I gave you, there is here a nice article by John Collins who uh, appeared in, uh, it's called uh, John Collins, the Son of God text from Kuman. It appeared in uh, uh, Deboire edited from Jesus to John. This was uh, studies uh, dedicated to uh, the Yonge. A festive to the young, in which John Collins showed, and I think he's right. No, we can debate about 4Q246. We are debating about what are those verses do there. Are they describing somebody that is Hebrews, somebody that thinks that he is an angel, although he's a human being, and the text is speaking about Antichrist? That's the way uh, Flusser thought about this. Other people, like uh, Father Fitzmaier, thought that those are positives. Uh, positive verses about somebody that will be like, uh, that will be, think about self of the most high, it is a positive things. Other people think that it's mosaic things. John Collins thinks that it's a very positive thing. So there are debates about how to understand 4Q246. But in this case, I mean, we have an Aramaic text, which is an executation of what we found in Luke chapter 1. And uh, it seems to me that there's no question that there is some relations, that the formula that we found in what Gabriel is saying to Mary in Luke 1 is similar, identical, to what we found in uh, 4Q246. And therefore, we have to think about, first of all, languages, as we did before. Does it point out that uh, at least those verses in Luke are based on an Aramaic text that later was translated into Greek? It tells us that those formula that we found in this text in Qumran that have to do with some kind of apocryphal text of Daniel. This uh, 4246 is based on the book of Daniel and it's uh, called the pseudo-Danielic text. And uh, the question is, is it speaking against uh, Antiochus IV, who, uh, the king who in 176 put the statue in the Jerusalemite temple and that's why we're celebrating Hanukkah because in 164, after three years, the statue was taken out by Judah the Maccabees. And some people think that 4Q246 is a text that speaks about the Hebrews of Antiochus IV. Uh, Flusser didn't want to have in such an historical understanding to it. He speaks, he speaks in general about people that are. But it's interesting that the same formula that is found in Kuman exists in uh, in uh, Luke 1, and 
it seems to me that nobody can deny. I mean, in the first example, in Matthew 5, it's not the same order. You can say that the three groups that appears in Matthew 5 doesn't exist in the same order in the Hodeot, and it might be not exactly a quotation. But here, I think that this is a wonderful example that we have exactly the same verses that we found in Luke, we found in Qumran K4. One of the nicest texts, probably the nicest text in Qumran, is 11Q Malkitzedek. And that appears in the second book. It's number three in the handout, but because of uh, number four, I'm sorry. And that's uh, 11Q13. And what makes this text so amazing is that the man who wrote it was very, very creative. He took uh, verses from Leviticus that speaks about in the year of the Jubilees, each of you should return to his property. And this text is speaking about, you know, if you became poor and you had to sell your property and now the Jubilees year come, you will get your property back. So it seems like something in technicals that have to do with money and with property, real estates. And what he does with it, he says, no, no, you're going to be claim to the lot of Malkitzedek. You will come back to the lot of Malkitzedek. And... Uh, He's speaking about something which is spiritual. He understands the verses in Leviticus not like speaking about real estate, not as speaking like you're going to return back to uh, your field, uh, but he speaks about this in, the, in Deuteronomy 15, about the Shemitah, about the seventh year. He speaks about this is something spiritual. In those years, you should come back to uh, the lot of Malkitzedek, the portion of Malkitzedek, and... Uh, he gives a wonderful, uh, a wonderful commentary about what is the Jubilee's year for, from a spiritual point of view. And he starts putting in verses from Isaiah, from some, and he's taking all those verses in order to explain to us what is a spiritual repentance is. What is it to do tshuva? What is it to go back to God? And what is it to... Uh, have a spiritual thing about returning to God. And you have all those verses that he throw in as a, when he starts from Levit Leviticus. And it's, I, I, I'm sure that anybody who read this text, uh, and he, he was surprised because he took those verses from Leviticus and Deuteronomy that speaks about money and speaks about becoming poor and things like that. And he's changing the whole attitude to those verses and saying, you didn't understand it. You thought that we're speaking here about money. No. We're speaking here about a spiritual invention. But what's interesting here is that we have all this text about Malkitzedek. Malkitzedek is mentioned twice in the Hebrew Bible, one in Genesis 14 and one in Psalm 110. In Genesis 14, it says that Abraham, after the battle, comes to Jerusalem, and Malkitzedek, who's a prince, who's a priest to the Most High, comes out, and Abraham gives him one tenth of what he has. And this is in Psalm 14. All we know is that Malkitzedek was from Jerusalem, and we know that he was a priest. Then in Psalm 110, we have a very strange verse in which God swears that he, uh, that you, Malkitzedek, you will become priest, and I swear that you will become priest for uh, uh, eternity. Nishba Hashem velo inachem. So God is swearing to Malkitzedek that he will return for the priesthood and he will uh, be a priest for an ending lasting time. Okay, now what's interesting is that we have a whole chapter in Hebrews chapter 7. And this is what I was hinting when I uh, said that by giving all those general talks, saying, you know, uh, we have four different areas in which uh, the scrolls had influence, when you do this kind of thing, you're missing some of the most important details. But if you read uh, Hebrews 7, the whole chapter is dedicated to Malkitzedek. And it's divided into two. In uh, verses 1 to 10, what the author of Hebrews 7 tells us is that we can learn from Genesis 14 that Malkitzedek is bigger than Levi. Why so? Because Levi was inside Abraham. And when Abraham gave the tent to Malkitzedek, it means that uh, Levi was paying the tent because Levi was inside Abraham. Therefore, we can see that Malkitzedek is a more important finger than Le Levi. And therefore, 
there's no question that uh, Malkitzedek is a more important priest because if it was the opposite, then Malkitzedek would have paid the ten to Avram and not Avram to Malkitzedek. Therefore, he learns from uh, Genesis 14 that there's no question that Malkitzedek is a more important uh, priest than the priests who are acting in the second temple period because they are the descendant of the Levites, or of the priests, they are from uh, Levi, and therefore Melchizedek is more important. And then he's in verse 11 to 28, he's using Psalm 110. And what he says, since the priesthood will change because God swore to Melchizedek that he will get the priesthood, therefore the law will change. And that's a proof that we should change the law. And that's a proof that uh, uh, the law will not be as important as it is today because if God promised Melchizedek that he will come to priest, and that show us how priesthood was so important in the Second Temple period because he's using the priesthood. He says there's no question if the priesthood is going to change and will be moved from the descendant of Levi to Melchizedek, therefore all the law in the Pentateuch will be changed. Now, what I believe we have here are two texts that are on a very long spectrum of text. What we found in Qumran is a positive text about Malkitzedek who came from priestly cycles and Malkitzedek here is, uh, is the ideal priest on the end of days. Now I didn't mention you but in one of the texts from Qumran K4 we have the opposite of Malkitzedek with Malkiresha. Malkitzedek is king of justice, and Malkiresha will be king of evil. And uh, Kumar are playing by using Malkitzedek, they have a dualistic view. There is Malkitzedek, who is the positive priest that we are waiting for it. He will come and he will change everything in the temple. The temple will not be corrupt. The temple will be run the way it should be run. We're waiting for the lot of Malkitzedek. That's what we have in 11Q Malkitzedek. And it doesn't say anything about taking the priesthood from the house of Tzadok. It doesn't tell us that the priesthood will change. He's saying Malkitzedek in Genesis 14 and in Psalm 110 is some kind of ideal priest, but he doesn't use it the way the author of Hebrews 7 does it. So we have in the right edge of the spectrum, we have a text which is still in Qumran, which is still priestly in his origin. He still thinks that the priesthood will not share. That's what we found in Qumran. What we have in Hebrews 7 is the left edge of the spectrum. The author of Hebrews 7 is using the two verses on Malkitzedek in order from Genesis 14 and from Psalm 110 in order to say the priesthood will change, the law will not be important, Jesus is the priest for the, uh, I, the end of days and he is Malkitzedek and therefore you should uh, believe in Jesus. But what we see here is two edges of the spectrum and the minute that we have this text we can see how much people were involved in the figure of Malkitzedek and before that uh, what I trying to hint is that reading Hebrew 7s without having the text of Qumran in front of you will be a mistake because uh, not that there is a direct connection between Hebrew 7 and 11Q Malkitzedek but 11Q Malkitzedek show us how much Malkitzedek was important and how much when the author of Hebrews 7 wrote this chapter he was using a figure that everybody was thinking about it. Now if you, uh, you saw there is a new book by the Jerusalem School and uh, about uh, Jesus last week and if you read in it there is there a big article by Steve Notley about bread and wine as opposed to wine and bread and uh, this had to do with Malkitzedek because in Genesis 14 it says that when Avram comes to Jerusalem and he comes uh, and he meets Malkitzedek in Jerusalem and pay him the tent, he says that he gives him and the order is lechem and yain, bread and wine in Genesis 14. First bread and then wine. Now the rabbis changed the order and today in every Jewish ceremony they change the order and now we are doing first wine and then bread as opposed to what's written in Genesis 14. And that's probably in order to remote ourselves from Malkitzedek because of texts like Hebrew 7s, maybe texts like 11Q Malkitzedek, which still have a lot of criticizing against the establishment in the temple because he says we need to wait for Malkitzedek because right now the priesthood is not, uh, is not run the way it should be run. So, and then this had to do with the Last Supper, as all of you know, in uh, Matthew and Mark, it's already in the rabbi's order, meaning first wine and then bread. In Luke, it's first 
bread and then wine, like in Genesis 14. So Luke is preserving probably the old thing. And in Paul, we have in uh, one of the description in uh, one of the letters of Paul, we have boat. He's some kind of confused. He first start with first bread and then wine, like we found in Genesis. Like we, I didn't say it, but I'm sorry. That uh, in uh, the manual of discipline or in the community rule in 1QS, when they describe the most important event of the day of the EC, and every day in the afternoon, the community had to gather together and to sit down to have their community meal. And he says that the community meal starts when the priest is, bl is blessing first over the bread and then over the wine. So in 1QS, in the manual of discipline, they preserve the order in Genesis 14, and that's what we find in Luke, while in the rabbis had reverse it, probably in order to remote ourselves, maybe from the people in Kuman, probably from al Kitsedek, and they wanted to. And what we see in the Gospels, what we see is that we have this shift, and Luke is preserving uh, the old order. And please look in this long and complicated article that Steve Notley wrote about this topic. But I, it seems to me that, you know, anybody who deals with Hebrew 7 should know about 11Q Malkitzedek, because not knowing that will be, uh, will show that it's a very, it will be a mistake. Okay, I'm moving now to number five. In the same page as 11Q Malkitzedek, we have a wonderful text, which is called 4Q 521, and Messiah Apocalypse. The heavens and the earth will listen to his Messiah, and none of them will stray, and so on. The holy ones, and then seekers of the Lord, sex yourself in his service. All of you helpful in his heart. Will you uh, not find the Lord in this, and so on? And the Lord will consider the pious, the chassidim, and call the righteousness by name. Over the poor, his spirit will be over, and so on. And the faithful with his power, and so on. This is a wonderful text. And what makes it wonderful is that he does here two very interesting things. First of all, he is using first Isaiah 61 and then uh, Psalm 146 in a very interesting way. Now, what's interesting here is the first sentence that I wrote, that the heaven and earth will listen to his Messiah. So in a way, what uh, he, God is doing is handing over his power. In uh, the future, uh, God uh, will hand over this power to his Messiah, and the heavens and the earth will listen to his Messiah. Later, it says that uh, over the poor, his spirit will, and so on. And then it says that he will, uh, he's quoting this verse, that he will liberate the captive, and he will restore the, sense of the, the sight of the blind, and he will uh, straighten the, uh, the, the blunt, and so on. Now... What he's doing here is using two different verses. In Isaiah 61, he speaks about the Messiah. He speaks about, uh, really, about a human being, uh, the servant of God, Eved Hashem. And uh, here he says, and I'll read it in Hebrew, and then I'll do my best to translate it. He says, Ruach Adonai Elohim Alai. יען משך השם אותי לבשר הנביאים שלך, אני לחבוש לנשברי לב, לקרוא לשבויים דרור ולאסירים פקוח פוח. So the prophet says that the spirit of God was on him, and the spirit of God has sent him to uh, tell, to be a messenger, to uh, proclaim the humble, and to uh, help the people that have a broken heart, and to open the captivities, and to let them free. Now, this is speaking about human beings. But in Psalm 146, in the end of the book of Psalm, we have a different description. In this description, God is doing all those wonderful things. Not a human being, but God himself. Now, I'm reading to you first in Hebrew, then I'll read it in English. It says that... Uh, God will do justice to the people that are now... Uh, are being, uh, that the rich ones are, uh, yes, they're hurting them. And then he will give bread to the people who are hungry. God will open the people who are in captive. God will open the eyes of the blinds. God, uh, he will strengthen the people who are bent, and he is the one who loves the righteousness. This is in Psalm 146. 
Now what happened here in this text that when you read it, you read 4Q521 and you don't know who he's talking. Is he talking about the Messiah or are we talking about God? Where does the shift takes place? He start by saying that uh, the heavens and hurt will listen to his Messiah. So there's no question at the beginning. But later on he speaks that over the poors he will do and all this thing that we found from line 5 onward. And you ask yourself, who? Is he speaking about God or is he speaking about the Messiah? There's no question that at the beginning he speaks about the Messiah because at the beginning he says that the Messiah will look over uh, the heaven and earth. Now, I want to uh, point out that in the first letter to the Corinth, to the Corinth uh, Paul is using exactly this kind of language. In chapter 15, in the first letter, and uh, he says exactly something like that. He speaks about God handing over his power to uh, the Messiah. And uh, yes, he says, what I, uh, verses 15, uh, Let's look at 21, 22. I'm sorry. It says, A Mashiach, the Messiah, comes from, uh, from the dead. And when the dead is coming uh, on this man, that's how uh, man will come from the dead. And, then, and he's speaking about that the, everybody will live. That's how the Messiah will live. And he speaks about... Uh, people that are raising from the deaths, and he's saying that the Messiah have a part of it. So what Paul is doing is basically what we see in 4Q521. He's saying that what we found in Psalm 146, it will be shifted, and God will do it through the Messiah. And I think that when we read 4Q521, the, the reason why it's written in this way, which is confusing, you don't know who is the one who should do these wonderful things, who is the one who will... Uh, open the eyes of the blinds, who's the one who's going to raise the dead from their graves. And uh, it seems not clear. And I think that he wrote it on purpose not clear. And I think that Paul is using exactly those ideas in the first letter of the Corinthians that he says that God will do it to the Messiah. The Messiah is important. It's the way that the Messiah raised from the dead. The Messiah will raise other people from the graves. And he's doing the same thing that the author of 4Q521 does. And the concept of what is the Messiah in uh, 4Q521 is important in order to understand this letter of Paul. Until now, we gave example of uh, the same kind of ideas and things that uh, Flusser did. So I want to uh, point it out now to what I said, the third part of uh, the beginning when I said, you know, everybody who speaks about uh, the contribution to the scrolls to understanding uh, the New Testament, uh, the third part of it is the institutes that we found in the early church. Uh, now we are uh, lucky. Uh, we have a few things. One of them is a register of rebukes. When we read the scrolls in Qumran, their most important day of the year was Pentecost, was Shavuot. They celebrate Pentecost in a way that they understood this a holiday, not as holiday of weeks, but olive days of swears, because in Hebrew, Shavua and Shavua is related to. It's relate, related already in Genesis when Avraham and Avimelech is meeting in uh, Be'er Sheva, and he says that he takes those seven sheep because they're going to swear. Kisham nish be'ush ne'em. Be'er Sheva, it's because of the swear and because of the seven sheep that Avraham gave Avimelech. So basically, we have this game between the number seven and swearing in Hebrew language, and it probably had to do with the way swears took place in antiquity, but it's not important for us. But they, every year on Pentecost, they took an oath that they will be faithful to God. This is the most important thing. Now, one of the things that happened during this ceremony is that they were rebuked. Now, in the Pentateuch, it says, you should rebuke your fellow member. But in a small community like Qumran, this became a uh, a real problem. And therefore, people in Kuman had a very uh, sophisticated way. They said, you should not rebuke your fellow. You should go to the overseer. You should go to the mevakir and tell him what you saw. The mevakir will check it. 
and the Mevaker will uh, deal with it. And if he needs, he will punish the people who uh, did something which is wrong, but you should not go directly to your fellow member and tell him something. Now, number six, 4Q477, is the only text in Kuman that have names of people that are, uh, we, we don't know the name of the members, but this is the only text in Kuman that we have, uh, and uh, this is <laughs> called a register of rebukes. They call it the rebukes of the overseer. It was probably a list of, uh, a list of scenes that the overseer used in one of those festivals of week in which he told people what you were wrong during this year, how you should improve yourself next year. Now, what's interesting here is that we would assume that there will be technical things. We would, you know, there are all those laws in Kuman, and they broke the law here, they didn't know it's Shabbat, and they broke the Shabbat, or they walked more than what they're allowed to walk on Shabbat, or maybe they touched. I, they were unpure and they touched the food of the many or something like that. We will think that this is technical. If you read uh, number six, if you read 4Q477, you'll see that it's all have to do with some kind of spiritual problems. Uh, they had uh, rebuked somebody because he's short-tempered. They rebuked somebody because he likes uh, life, good life. That's the last one. He had, they rebuked somebody because he disturbed the spirit of the community. He rebuked somebody because... And so he loved his uh, fellow, he loved his uh, re uh, related fellow, and therefore he didn't rebuke him probably or something like that. We have a list of uh, people that were rebuked. Now, I believe that the whole concept in Kumran sheds light on Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, we have this description that Matthew says that uh, how you should rebuke, and if you rebuke the right way, you will gang uh, friend, and if you rebuke, rebuke the wrong way, you will get an enemy. And it seems to me that the same concern that we found in the scrolls about the way, this is Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. And uh, if it's, again, tells us how you should rebuke people, and you can see this, the way that the people in Kuman were so sensitive to rebuke their uh, fellow members in the right way and not to insult them. And that's the same thing that we found in Matthew 18. The last thing that I want to tell you is the last text that was found in Kumran, and it was found in uh, 1996. In the end of 1996, there were excavation, and they found number seven, an ostracon in Kumran, in which Choni gives uh, all of his belonging to a guy named Elazar, son of Nachmani, and he gives him everything he has, his fig trees, his olive trees, his house, everything he has. Now, in uh, the community rule in 1QS that was found in Kuman, it said that when somebody wanted to join the group, it was a long process. It took two years. In the first year, the months before Pentecost, the first Pentecost that he will spend in Kuman, he had his own property. Then Pentecost came, the festival of weekend, and they will take an oath. And if they will decide to accept him, he will give all his belonging to the overseer. And the overseer will write him an account. And uh, then he will start his second year as a candidate. And the second year will take a whole year, from one festival of week to the second festival of weeks. And before the second festival of weeks, they're going to take an oath again and see if they want to accept them or not. And if the majority will want to accept them, he will take a second oath in the festival of weeks. And from now on, he became a full member in the Kumran group. And he will, if he leaves the group, he will not get his property back. But if he leaves the group in the second year, from the first Pentecost to the second Pentecost, he will get his belonging back. So the second year is something that they will check him, he will check the group, and he will see if he wants to join the group or not. This all is described in 1QS. Here we found an ostracon in Kuman in which somebody wants to join the group and gives all his belonging to an overseer called Elazar son of Nachmani. And probably Elazar son of Nachmani wrote an account. So what we have here is an actual account that somebody wrote to somebody who wanted to join the group. Now when this thing came, uh, Flusser wrote an article which I mentioned here, and you can see it. Uh, there is an article by Flusser, Ostrakon from Kuman, Throw Light on the First Church, Jerusalem Perspective 53, 1997. So it's in the Jerusalem Perspective, and you should all read this very nice article. Now what he did is explain to us Act 4 and 5. What we have in Act 4 and 5 is that uh, two people wanted to join the group, and they sold their field, and instead of bringing everything, uh, Hanania and Shapira does not give everything, and Peter becomes very mad at them because they are lying, and they uh, died. What's important to us is that later in Act 5, it says that because of that, because of what happened, this is Act 5.13, 
because of what happened, there are a lot of people who saw the disciple of Jesus as their leaders, but they were afraid to join the group. So because of what happened, you can see that people went halfway. They saw the disciple as their leaders, but they were not willing to give all their property to Peter as they were demanded to do so. So what we have here is that in the Jesus movement, we have the same thing that we found in Kuman. In Kuman, there are two texts of rules. There are rules for people who are willing to go all the way and to share property. That's what we found in 1QS. And uh, what we found in the Damascus documents are people who are giving only two days a month to the community, meaning 8% of their income, not more than 8%. And those are people that have, they have private property, they have families, they have their own field. And in the Damascus document, it says, if you want to donate from your property. So there's no question that the people who lived according to the Damascus document have property and were not willing to go all the way and to share property as the people who was living according to the community rule, according to 1QS. So we found in Kuman two types of Essenes. Essenes who are willing to share their property and to become full members and to share everything with their fellows members. That's what we found in 1QS. And we found people that are still see the teacher of righteousness as their leader. They still believe in everything that the teacher had said, but they were not willing to go all the way into share property. What Flusser showed in this article in Jerusalem Perspective is that the same thing that we found in Kuman, we found in Acts 4 and 5. That after what happened to Hanania and Shapira, people saw Peter as their leader, saw James as their leader, but they were not willing to go all the way into give their property exactly in Kuman. Now, how did this happen? It's probably happened that uh, when uh, John the Baptist was killed in 29, some of his uh, disciples, some of his followers joined the Jesus movement and brought those ideas with them from the Judean desert to the early church. And that's why when we read Act, we find the same thing as sharing property, having a community meal, having an episcope. So, uh, and now this thing about disciples who are going all the way and give their property to Peter as people that are not doing that. So what we see here is that we can use Kuman in order to understand the early church and we can see that the same institute that exists in Kuman later was uh, borrowed by the early church. I want to finish this lecture in a, a private column and just, you know, in memory of my teacher, David Flusser. In uh, the Psalm scroll from Cave 11, there is a wonderful hymn which is the alphabetic hymn to Zion, in which somebody wrote a love song to uh, Jerusalem, which was organized alphabetic. I'll read the first four verses in Hebrew. They are organized according to the alphabet, and then I'll read them in Hebrew. It says, As kirech livrachat zion, bechol meodi ani avtich, baruch lo olamim zichrech, this is the bet, then the gimel, gdolatik vatech zion veshalom, vetochelet yeshuatech lavo, and then the verse, that's, that's why I'm reading it to you, do vedor yaduru bach vedorot chasidim tifertech. I will read it in English. I remember you for blessing on Zion, with all my might have I loved you, May your memory be blessed forever. Great is your hope in prosperity, and great is the expectation of the salvation to come. And now the verse that I'm uh, speaking about, generation after generation will dwell in your midst, and generation of pious will uh, glorify your beauty. And this is the Dalit verse, and the hey, they will yearn for the day of your salvation. And one day, I was teaching this in the university, and I read this, and I... Uh, uh, I read those verses and I thought about Luke 2. In Luke 2, baby Jesus is being brought to the temple and there is a prophet named Hannah who lives in the temple for so long and she's there and she never leaves the temple and when she sees baby Jesus, she stands up and she says to everybody who are waiting for the salvation of Jerusalem, she said, this is the man we were waiting for. This is in Luke 2. Verse 36, 38, it's had to do with the end of Luke in 24, when at the end, the last chapter of Luke, it says in verse 52, 53, that they will dwell in the temple forever and ever. That's how Luke ends. The, Luke ends is that by not leaving the temple. So what we have in Luke is that someone who never leaves the temple, waiting for the salvation of uh, Jerusalem. And the same thing we have in this hymn that speaks about generation after generation will... Uh, dwelt in your midst, and they uh, yearn for the day of your salvation. So I came to Flusser very excited and said, you know, there is this hymn to Zion in uh, 
uh, 11 Q sum A in the sum scroll from cave 11, and you know there is this alphabetic king, and he speaks about people who will dwell in Jerusalem and wait for the salvation. And Flusser uh, heard everything I had to say patiently, and he says, wonderful, wonderful. And then he said, why don't you open this book? And he showed me that he wrote it uh, 15 years before me. <laughs> and I, you know, but, but, you know, finding it and thinking about it, and then I'm glad that uh, I was thinking the same way Professor Flusser did. I hope I did it the same today. Thank you very much.